Development of fifty by fifty. Which is at four o'clock. Yes. Good. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start your cow meeting today. Do you have any corrections, additions? Whoa, <laughs> for a hot day, we're sure gonna move. Wayne? I have two, please. Um, one is showcasing Wetaskiw in an area. Okay. And, then, and then the other one is, uh, hmm. uh, just a question on brand relaunch, or rebrand launch, there we go. Gabriella? Canada Day. Thank you. Tyler? That on two C, D, and E. Thank you. So we'll move on to Municipal Service Division. Good afternoon. Um, so I just wanted to uh, just give a brief overview of, of some updates, I guess, for Municipal Services Division. Uh, since your last update in September of 2020. Uh, for the airport, um, we had our uh, airport maintenance operator start um, in May uh, for the six month term position. Uh, and this allows the airport to run seven days a week, which is uh, industry standard for certified airports. Wetaskiwin will also be hosting um, the 2021 Alberta Air Tour. Wetaskiwin will be the last stop on the tour. Uh, and there's going to be some, uh, I believe, some activities planned uh, depending on COVID-19 protocols. Um, the airport has been working with our economic development department on some strategies on how to grow the airport businesses and how our airport resources can be po positioned to other business development throughout the city. We've also been exploring some partnership opportunities with Edmonton International Airports. And uh, our annual airport barbecue obviously has been postponed due to COVID. Um, however, we will resume those in 2022. For our planning and engineering department, uh, we have in progress, we've partnered with SATE, uh, their GIS uh, department to map our urban greenery. We have um, a number of capital projects um, that is either happening now or just about to happen. And they are uh, majority of them are on budget and on time. Um, with respect to our uh, development services area, um, our uh, development permit applications are slightly down from last year. Um, in 2020 total, we had about 104 uh, development permit applications and to date we are sitting at 38. Uh, our building permit applications are about on par as they were from last year. Last year we had a total of 82. Um, looking at, um, I guess, just sign permits and business license applications. Um, we don't have uh, the numbers from 2020, so I can't give you a comparison, um, but they're there for you. Within our public works department, our fleet services um, have been busy, um, making sure our fleet and equipment are, are uh, safe on the streets. We have had over 70 services completed to date. Um, our parks department has been tree pruning, uh, removing dead trees, uh, planting new trees. Um, the fruit forest is planted in Montgomery Park. They've done um, numerous uh, flower plantings in the planters along um, the streets and by the Lake Park. 
they've been trapping gophers, removing graffiti tags, um, and then they've also put in about 30 additional uh, community garden plots from the demand from the community. And they, we had six outdoor skating rinks through the winter, uh, which were uh, very popular. Within our transportation area, uh, through the winter months, uh, basically uh, some, a couple of stats here, we done a, a, did about 127 loads of sand, sand that was applied for traction control, 40 tons of road salt was used for ice control, and they removed 850 loads of snow from uh, the streets uh, this past winter. Throughout the spring, they've done their street sweeping, uh, which they ended up collecting about 580 cubic yards of sand. Uh, they've done uh, some road repairs during the spring thaw. There was some, uh, some issues with, um, uh, I guess, compaction issues. Uh, with some utility work that was done last year. So they've patched that up until we can get in there to pave. Later this summer, they've been doing uh, pat patching and pothole repairs, a lot of sign replacements, our alley uh, grading and graveling program, the uh, public works and utilities. So our public works building um, is nearing completion. They're just uh, working on a few deficiencies before uh, the team can move in. Uh, doing dust control. They've also constructed a new aggregate storage area that's located at the Southeast Snow Disposal Site. They've also assisted the fire department in crash simulations for their training purposes. Within our utilities area, um, there's been a lot of water main repairs, curb cock repairs, hydrant replacements, catch basin manhole replacements, some isolation valve uh, repairs, as well as working on our lead program. And then within our waste and recycling, uh, department. Uh, we've seen a slight increase in landfill tonnages uh, in comparison to last year. And then we had our household hazardous waste roundup the third week of May, uh, which saw um, quite a few people run through uh, dropping off their, uh, their waste. We've also commenced automated waste collection in two of our mobile home parks, Wild Rose Garden Estates and Jubilee Place. And I'm open if anyone has any questions. Any questions, Wayne? I just have two. Um, one of the statements having to deal with, I gotta find it here, bear with me. Um, under public works, fleet, parks, and transportation. Third bullet, five of 11 commercial vehicles inspections were completed. So the fact that it's five of 11 suggests to me they had planned to do 11 and got five done or what? through the chair to Councillor Nielsen. Yes, the, so far to date, they've completed five of their 11. So they will still be completing those other six, yes. Okay, and the other question I have, um, do we have, do we, do we maintain a historical data file? So for example, if I said, um, Tons of salt put on the road this year. Um, how does that compare to five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years? Would we have that kind of data? And how many potholes were done this year versus three years ago versus six years ago? Do we, we, do we collect and hold that kind of material information? We do keep that information. Um, if, uh, if council so chooses, I can certainly um, go and dig up some of those things for stat purposes. Um, I, um, can definitely provide uh, historical data um, at request for sure. Okay. No, I just, not that I need it or want it. It's just, do we have it if we do need it? Thank you. Any further questions? Hi. The airport or the fly in that they're doing on July 10th, I'm not able to make it. So if the weather is good that day and another member of the deputy mayor wants to attend um, on the city's behalf or if anybody else wants to, they can. Uh, Dr. Brown, are you still out for July, no? Oh, your last one? But it's a free breakfast on my drive. <laughs> <laughs> for you, we'll buy a breakfast. <laughs> I don't know who's deputy mayor in July. Councilor Black, so if you're available on July 10th, um, contact Candace Coughlin, and she has some information on the fly, and Kathy might as well. I have a few questions. One to my, my colleague regarding the, you were asking about the sand and salt. I think 
just before uh, budget or winter comes, we always approve so much tonnage for sanding. So I think we have that on, on record because every year we just, well, it's just by the ton, we buy it. So uh, my other question is at the landfill, when somebody brings in, let's say topsoil, clay or anything, you know, I know it's free, but it's weight. Does that weight go against our total volume, what we're allowed? Or so let's say we bring 100 tons of topsoil or clay. Does that go on how much garbage goes to landfill, but it's just used for coverage? Does that affect what we're allowed to use? The tonnages that are actually landfilled, those do not apply to that. If it is used as daily cover, um, it is not included in the tonnages. However, it will obviously impact the elevation of the landfill, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so it's not included. Say we're allowed 12,000 tons a year, we bring in 1,000 tons of clay, so it doesn't affect that. No. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our CMP presentation. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Um, um, we have a, a, present, a, a report and quarterly presentation to you today for Q1 2021 from Inspector Keith Durantz. Uh, just a reminder to the committee that council did approve of uh, RCMP priorities on June 14th, and Keith has done his best to try to align uh, his presentation to those priorities. So I will hand the mic to him. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I have a couple of reports here I'm gonna go over with you that were submitted earlier, one being the RCMP monthly policing report, municipal policing report. Um, I'll say uh, at the front end here, the first two pages are usually completed by our op strategy branch, our stat statisticians up in headquarters, in which with regards to staffing levels, uh, quarterly estimates on pay overtime and the budget. And then the last two pages are usually completed by myself with regards to the community pro, uh, priorities and the results thereof. Because I was not gonna be here next, uh, that next month at council to provide a full quarterly update as of the end of June, I took the opportunity now to come in and give you an update as far as I could on Q1. And I will have a full update for you on Q2, uh, which will have all these numbers uh, put in. What I do have for you is my, my best way to fill out most of this report. Um, a lot of the high, high titles and stuff, especially with regards to dates, I cannot, it's a uh, mandatory field that's locked out and I can't change the thing. So I will go through and I'll give you my best understanding of all the numbers that I have currently here. So under human resources, uh, the numbers there, we have uh, 31 established positions with 26 members working three members on special leave and one should be say should have one hard vacancy at this point in time. I will add to that that as of uh, second week of July, we'll have two hard vacancies. However, by the end of July and the first week of August, we have three more members coming into the detachment. So those hard vacancies will be short lived. Uh, support staff uh, remaining relatively static, 11.5 uh, positions, so 10.5 working. We have one uh, uh, employee away on mat leave should be returning the end of August. Uh, on your uh, municipal budget financial o and I have the final, uh, if you want to pen these in for you, I got these this morning. Um, over time for P14, so this would be the end of the our fiscal year at the end of March. So over time we were uh, down by 114,825. Operating and maintenance, we are up by 2,000. Core commissioners uh, down by 14,524. Uh, with an overall savings uh, from last year uh, to, to this, for, sorry, from 2020, 20, 2019 to 2020 of 112,833. Where we saw the increases on the operating and maintenance side of things were with regards to vehicle repairs, which were close to 14,000 and fuel being at uh, over $5,300 from the year previously. Sorry for those quick numbers, but I just uh, wanted to get you a, an end there. I'll have a, Q, a strong Q2 for you uh, with where we're at at that point. P14, 
Page two, it should say uh, April, May at the category at the top there. Uh, these numbers are, are up to the end of May. Uh, persons crimes are up 57%, property crime down 14% with overall criminal code down 38%. Uh, of particular note on the persons crimes being up, this is in relation to assaults, uh, criminal harassment and uttering threats being up significantly. Uh, and when checking the statistics on these, these are based on uh, an increase in domestic violence files by approximately 32%. Uh, criminal code uh, overall up just 6%. And then the significant ones, other traffic down 80, uh, provincial traffic up 32 uh, from 497 to 654. That's being the provincial traffic unit being in the area, writing uh, additional tickets in the area. Uh, and then you'll see the remainder uh, motor vehicle collisions uh, down 33%. So overall, April, May over year to year from 20 to 21, a decrease in property crime by 14% was primarily driven by break and enters being down 24% from 82 to 62. Uh, theft under uh, 5,000 being down 11% from 148 to 140. And theft of motor vehicle down 53% from 37 to 19 reported files. Page three is, is our priorities. And we've gone over these before. Uh, this page only has room for three priorities, but we have five. So I've put them in numerical order. Uh, so to uh, reduce and prevent property crime, uh, thus far our priorities, our initiatives under that priority are completing search warrant. We've done one of 12 so far. Uh, Intel meetings, we've done three of 12. Uh, and proactive drug enforcement, we've completed 10 investigations of the total 60 that we are ballparking for the year. Prolific offender management, uh, curfew checks, 45 of 600. We're a little short on that one there, and that is due to somewhat of a breakdown with regards to the analyst not being uh, in the detachment. We're going to be another couple months before we see that analyst position being filled. Um, so uh, what the analyst does is she does a complete review of all those uh, prolific offenders in our detachments as their conditions of their probation and other uh, court documents, and then updates the curfew checkbook, who, which then the members utilize to go and then do the curfew check. So there's just a little bit of uh, intel uh, grinding of information there that's kind of slowing things up a little bit. Uh, warrantless media outputs, three of 30. Uh, I'm working with our local media here and our local media rep at the detachment to try and do a weekly input into the local paper here moving forward, which should uh, significantly bump that up. Uh, priority three, persons crimes. Um, and then you see the results on number three on the next piece down, bear spray bylaw. Uh, we're in the process with CPO Sergeant Trent uh, Yeager to uh, develop a, a bear spray bylaw for the city. Uh, we have a draft into legal to have a look at the wording of that particular bylaw and that will be forthcoming to you guys in Q2. Uh, education program weapons, guns and violent, uh, weapon and gun. Uh, is in development. It's this COVID restricted. This is more of a face to face for our members getting out in the community and speaking to people on this. And we're assigning this project to one of the incoming cadets, which will be arriving in second week of July. Number four is uh, reduce and prevent property crime. And one of the initiatives there is the pawn shop bylaw that we were discussing here just a couple weeks ago, uh, past third reading and uh, pending uh, uh, pawn shop owners uh, in engagement. We're gonna have to be in touch with them. Trent is working on this. Uh, and then getting the uh, agreed upon um, database and computers and that sort of stuff going and some training to those uh, shopkeepers. Uh, community events, um, not a big one in the city here. We've completed one of our eight boat patrols. We have two planned for June. Social media programming, uh, we have one of our members working on a Facebook site uh, with regards, and this is gonna be launched in the mid-summer, mm -hmm. perhaps probably closer to the first part of September. Uh, they're go undergoing some training on exactly how to run this Facebook site um, and keeping in line all of the rules with um, regards to bilingualism. And downtown foot patrols, I uh, have 38 of 250 here. The, that number is actually at 54. Uh, and 38 of those have been done on the overtime budget and the remaining done off the watch on a regular patrol basis. Um, last page is the community engagements. Uh, I won't bore you, you can read those ones on the number of dates. So we've had uh, 
seven engagements over this last quarter with regards to community consultations and so on. Lastly is the secondary report with regards to the downtown patrols. That's this document here. So what I've done, uh, as indicated there in Q1, we've completed is uh, 54 downtown, uh, downtown patrols in the area. And we're begin keeping the statistics with reference to these foot patrols. Uh, these are self-explanatory. Business contacts would be the number of times that the member has contacted one of the business owners. And then subject contacts are the number of people that they're engaging with on the foot patrols. Total number of foot patrols, uh, vehicle patrols are also there. Those are mostly completed by either the members on the foot patrol, if it's in Clement, or if they're doing regular patrols uh, outside of their regular foot patrol on their shift. And also all the regular members keeping uh, the downtown area uh, in their mind when they're doing their patrols to and from the detachment. Total number of foot patrols are there, 187 thus far to and that's in keeping with the number we've done in June so far of 11. Uh, of that, 54 have been completed in Q1. Calls for service in and around the downtown core, you see the totals there at 237. Number of arrests, 103, and total charges, 76. The next table goes into the number of uh, calls for service just in relation to the 27, 24-7 hub. Uh, and these, these numbers are self-explanatory with regards to the different types of offenses that we are dealing with there. Uh, what you will notice is the total number for April and May is at 39 and 38 uh, total uh, occurrences there. And these numbers are staying rather consistent. I suspect it's gonna be up a little higher in June. It has been a little busier around the hub in the month of June. Uh, but again, I'll have those full numbers for you uh, on the next report. And lastly, on the last page, uh, other Q2 curfew checks, uh, 45, street checks, 345, and check stops, four, and warrants executed being 60. Uh, that is a summary of my reports. I'm uh, able to answer any questions you may have with regards to these statistics. Any questions? Wayne and ND. Keith, when I do the um, the chart on um, downtown foot patrols, and uh, it's, it's in the blue one there, and uh, so calls for service over one, two, three, four, five months, two thirty-seven. Um, almost half, so 40 some odd percent of those end up in a, an arrest. And so 103 arrests out of 237 calls. And then the charges being 76%. So of those arrests, they were significant enough to have charges filed. Is, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, those, those numbers, the 76 could be anything from a ticket uh, or to cause disturbance or, or something more significant. And would you be able to tell me um, how many of these ended up before a judge? Because part, part of, part of the, the conversation that we had with yourself and Open Door was the whole um, referral process back for for counseling and things of that nature. So I'm, I'm just trying to follow it through to its conclusion. And if you don't have it, that's fine. I don't have that um, number. Um, I'm just trying to think if maybe I could extrapolate it back from the other. If I was to add up all the number of charges in the other column here, seven, 10, 13 charges. Um, no, I, okay. I, I'd be too much of a random guess. Okay. You can almost say that all 13 charges in that were in relation to the hub are, are most likely going before a JP of some sort. The 13 in June. Yeah, from May, April and May in the next column down, you add all the charges together, those would go specifically um, where we'd have something like a fail to comply, where you see across there, you have one in April, one in May, 
total of two, two arrests, two charges, those definitely would be going before JP, for example, right? That's where you see no, you don't see too much ambiguity there. It's, it's a straightforward breach is a straightforward criminal code charge, right? Okay, now you've lost me somewhere in this process. Sorry. No, so, so because when you're saying you see one and then you see another one in June, I don't know where you're seeing one. No, May. Sorry, so you, if you look at the second column down, these are all the charge occurrences and charges and arrests in relation to the hub itself. That's why oh, I was trying to go back to, I was trying to take that number, take it up to the okay, 76 and see if I, I could you. extrapolate back and it yeah. wasn't quite working, so. Okay. I guess I was just, the reason I asked the question, I was wondering how successful we are, we are being with regard to taking it back through the court system and rather than, than jail time or Fines yeah, that don't get paid. I, I think a better way to uh, to to update you on this would be our our drug and mental health diversion program that we've established with the hub, and that's where we're arresting uh, someone who's a bit of a prolific offender and needs to be kind of forced into some sort of uh, compliance with regards to programming or counseling or that right. sort of thing. What we found is we've we've charged thirteen people thus far and put them into the program but what we're finding is the and i want to say this uh, politely as i can the comprehension of the fate of the charges and that sort of stuff is being lost on the individual and that in a lot of cases um, the mental health is is not where it needs to be in order for them to understand the pitfalls of where they're going so we're actually actually having to kind of pull back from that and relook at it a little bit and and again kind of adjust our program accordingly instead of just firing these people right into the court system. Um, we have to look at the mental health piece first, so is it a case of they come before the court two weeks down the road and we've got all the re supporting report from the hub and from our file and everything else, but they perhaps need a 30 day uh, assessment. So we're trying to get that done on the front end rather than finding out halfway through the process. Does that explain where I'm going with that? Or did I lose you? No, no, no. to some degree, no, I get it. I guess the question that arises out of that for me is, so are we, Are we not doing what we said we were going to do because of the, the lack of the connection between the crime and, the, and the, the direction? So I guess what I'm leading up to is, are you or Open Door, and this sounds inappropriate, I don't mean to sound that way, playing judge and jury, playing judge and jury or in that they're not getting to the magistrate? No, they'll get to the magistrate. It's a case of we may have to do some more proactive work with mental health prior to them getting to the magistrate so that they can have an under better understanding of you know uh, the circumstances what they found themselves in so for example then you pick up a prolific yep. offender if i can use that term and you recognize some significant mental health issues yep and so rather than processing them through the court system it would be how do you how do you mandate that that extra mental health intervention? It's still within the judicial system. It's just before they start giving out sentences and before they start applying um, uh, counseling or treatment or something like that. It's just one step before it's held in abeyance. It's brought before the judge. The judge would then order, say, a 30 day psychiatric assessment. OK, OK. I'm it's in the system. It's just okay. a case we're having to kind of rein the horse in just a little bit saying, okay, we need to walk before we can jog, before we can run. Yeah. We have to put the walk step in first. Okay. I got it, thank you. Okay. Keith, um, verbally you had said that you were down in your overtime cost this year, is that? Yep, everything is in the, is in the negative. So we had budgeted um, extra overtime for foot patrols and things right. like that. Is that worth into that dollars or is it dollars above that? It, it will come back as a credit to you more or less. Like, no, not, no, it won't come back as a credit. The bill will be there, yeah. but you saved it on, on last year's budget. You weren't billed 100, or 112,833 in relation to the year before. 
the, the budget will still be there for the, for the downtown foot patrols, but we saved money overall in 1920. So we still will cut the extra check for the, I think it was $42,000 or whatever we budgeted for. Right. So this year, if we continue to save on overtime with yeah. added members to the strength, we're going to save save member uh, overtime on member hours because we have the extra members. That will result in a saving in the overtime budget, which ultimately would work out to be a push at the end of next fiscal year. It, so there's X number of dollars we pay for staff wages, and then there's overtime on top of that. Which is budgeted for. Sorry? Which is budgeted for. Which is usually budgeted in, budgeted in by OSB will give you a, an overall, what you need to kind of put away to make sure that you get there, right? right. By saving $112,000 off the overtime budget, that isn't compared to the year before that. And the year, and we saved on the year before that as well, right? So consequently by, looking at keeping an eye on the bottom line, ensuring we have as member, many members on, on the road as we can, we're saving on the overall bill to the city in overtime. The budget budget for this particular stuff on the thing will be there, we'll have to pay that, but I'm sure the savings will come back in the number of extra members we've applied to the road this year should have an, another resulting savings in overtime like we see here. I guess then my question is why then those extra foot patrols wouldn't have just gone over there and then we wouldn't have had to cut that $42,000 check. Yeah. We could have done it that way, but then if we have four major events, at, say at the end of this last year, then all of a sudden you guys are getting a bill for $250,000 extra in overtime that you guys would not be aware of. At least now you know exactly what that amount of dollar, dollar value will be. And if I'm able to keep the pencil sharp for the rest of the year and keep as many chairs filled as I can, we should see that savings come back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and we had set up an RCMP reserve, Sue, we'd set up an RCMP reserve and part of what we're going to be using that for is the contract negotiations that are going on right now with the RCMP and the salaries going up because those are going back to 2016, I think, in terms of contract, contract negotiations. So we'll have back pay going to members from 216 and we are using the RCMP reserve to cover those off. Because I'm unre unrepresented, I can't comment on that. That's fine. That's for the MPF to say, yep. no, but I believe they're going back to 17, 17? not 16. Okay, perfect. Um, and with the stats you have related to the hub, yep. do you have, and I mean, it goes to, um, total criminal code calls for service, as opposed to the specifics for the hub. Would you have a breakdown of how many assaults, how many breach of peace, um, those same stats citywide to compare what we're seeing from the hub or downtown? And if, if that's- I, I don't have that, but I can get it to you for the next quarter. Yeah. It's easy enough for me to just pull those out and I'll just minus them from the totals and I should be able to break that out for okay. you. That would be fantastic. Um, and the subject contacts, is that member initiated? Like member A sees somebody on the street, they go and initiate that contact? Or it's someone coming up to us talking about, or anyone that we might want to interact with during our foot patrol. Perfect. And we split out the ones where we actually go into a business and actually talk to a business person or right. that sort of stuff, we split that up. That was it, thanks. <laughs> I'd love to be able to share what actually is in here, but I'm not at liberty to eat too. <laughs> okay, any further questions to Keith? Going once, twice. Thank you, Keith. And I understand there's gonna be a conversation with regards to reporting and statistics and what you wanna see and what you don't wanna see and that sort of stuff. And, and I'm very open to just like uh, what was uh, proposed here, just can you give me a comparison of this for next time? And I have no problem with that other than I'm probably doing it myself. But um, if, if you wanna know how many in our weapons offenses, if it's guns or this or that, I just need a, 
a little bit of lead time and I can pull those numbers apart. It may take, if it gets too daunting, if I have to go through a thousand files to determine if we had eight bear spraying and not, then I'll, I'll let you know that ahead of time. But if you want a breakdown accordingly, I can do that. I just need a little bit of lead time and an idea of what it is you're looking for. And I have no problem with that. Okay, thank you. And we'll move on to uh, 2C, which is plain regarding your and and some of it's sort of been addressed, but and I, I know it, with the Alberta Air Tour coming, um, and, and Kathy has mentioned there's some activities planned. We're 12 days away, effectively today, and and pending what happens with COVID restrictions and so forth. But um, how does how does this play out in terms of part of our tourism marketing and and all the rest of it? So. Do we have any idea kind of what's in the mix or what might be happening? I don't know. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Nielsen, I obviously was away last week and I, I have not had time to catch up with the team on this right now. Um, I will touch base. I know Candace has been talking to Wendy about a bunch of different opportunities to showcase the city. so. I will take it um, as an information request and we'll send an update to council when I get that information. We can't hear. Please speak up, please. Candace. I'm sorry. Um, with, with everybody hoping to get back to some sense of normalcy, um, a year ago, maybe it was two years ago now, um, we made arrangements to um, tr create a transportation um, thing out to Muscat Cheese for, for Powwow. And, and, and given, I guess, on some levels, our, our limitations in, in continuing that relationship building with Muscat Cheese, and as part of potential showcase of Wetaskiw in an area. Um, I, th I thought the whole notion of, of facilitating getting folks out to a powwow, um, and especially in light of what our country has seen in the last short while here, uh, I, I didn't want to lose, I didn't want to lose this as an opportunity to showcase our community and to to maintain a relationship with with four bands at Muscat Cheese, and so I, I hope that that's still um, potentially on our radar to to facilitate something like that, or at least have conversations as we get more information, perhaps out of Muscat Cheese, about what they might be doing and how we might want to help facilitate some activities there. So that that would be my hope, but I just make it as a statement. I don't know what my colleagues feel about it, but and then my last comment is I've had a number of comments come back to me um, about the the rebranding launch and and a particular picture that was taken that's received quite a bit of notoriety in terms of we're, we're trying to convince people that we have mountain scenes in Wetaskiwin and, and Ren doing a masterful job of saying, no, really, it's just clouds in the background. But at first blush, I think that picture is really misleading and, and I, I don't know, is there intentions to do something with that or just try and convince everybody that we're not advertising that we live in the Rockies, that it's really, no. And, I, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but my first reaction when I saw it, I thought, where the heck and why would we use this picture? And it wasn't until I blew it right up, it was as Ren said, it was clouds, not mountains. But at first blush, it looks like we were selling that we lived in Canmore or something. Has there been any conversation, Sue, on that? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Nielsen, I, I believe there was, but I wasn't here. So um, if any of the staff have any information, they can tap in. 
can take that one. So through the chair to Councillor Nielsen, uh, we have definitely received that feedback as well. Um, we're going to be looking at changing out that photo um, for a different one, still from by the lake, but on a different, maybe more clear day where there are not clouds in the background. Um, and we'll be looking at switching that over out over the next couple of weeks um, on all of our digital assets. Great. I, I just want to comment on Ren's masterful approach to trying to convince everybody of, about really look look just a little bit harder folks but, but she handled it really well so thank I you. can confirm it is by the lake park <laughs> <laughs> thank you we'll go to to uh, Gabe. thank you so with candidate coming up and as councillor nielsen already brought up with uh the situation that's kind of been unfolding across the country right now with um, finding mass graves in residential schools. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the fact that the new data has shown that if they continue finding bodies at the rate that they are, they're now predicting that there is upwards of 70,000 more children buried in these unmarked graves. And they said that even at the rate that we're looking at right now, it's 20 times more than the original estimate from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, with all that being said, um, the town of Devon already released a statement that they would like to see their residents wear orange during uh, Canada Day. St. Albert has already canceled their Canada Day celebrations and numerous other cities across the country has. Um, I'm personally going to be wearing orange on Canada Day, and I just wanted to encourage um, other councillors to wear orange as well, and anyone else that feels the need to commemorate these people as well. Um, can't you. you can't hear? Can't hear you. I just can't hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm personally going to be wearing orange on Canada Day. And um, I just want to encourage other councillors that if they would like to also wear orange on Canada Day. I think that it is a good show of support for those that have been affected um, from all of these findings and to our First Nations communities that we are close to as well. Um, I just think that it is a good show of support for them. So I just want to encourage the other council members to wear orange as well. Right. Just, I'll speak to that too as well. Um, I had the president of the Legion reach out um, for my thoughts on Canada Day ceremonies and the program that they're going to be having with the pancake breakfast. And he asked that I reach out to the Four Nations. So I was able to speak to three of the chiefs and all three chiefs still supported the ceremonies taking place at uh, the Legion. I'm hoping to get at least one of them come and speak at it as we have the, the convoy coming through the city as well. They've scheduled that program for one o'clock at the Reynolds Alberta Museum. So I've asked that they attend the ceremony as well. And if they do, that they'll have the opportunity to speak there as well. But of three out of the four that I was able to speak to all supported um, the Legion still holding their ceremonies um, and taking them over to silence and using it as an opportunity to um, share all that's been going on and not still take away from a dark piece of our history that we're celebrating, or a dark piece of our history in Canada isn't all of what Canada and its history is. So the fact that we are still celebrating Canada Day, but taking the opportunity to acknowledge um, the remains that have been found with the residential schools and everything going along with that. So we do have support from three quarters of West which I just haven't heard from the other chiefs. Absolutely, no thanks for the input on that. But yeah, that's why I was saying, um, instead of canceling everything, I would like to just see Waves of orange. So. Yeah. Uh, and just for that last formal information request that you have taken, make sure that it's a direction of council and not from one member of council. Not that I don't oppose that you're going to get that information back, but if we're going to get into the habit of getting a request for information from council, not from an individual member of council. Is that for the air show? Sorry? The air show stuff? Yeah. The information coming back or and the, the uh, events that councillor nielsen is looking for for information back from administration so Here. my my intention was just to give you an update on what what admin had talked about yep. related to the air show and i was yep. just going to leave it but at you that. had taken it as a formal information request okay so still a direction from council not uh council yes okay yeah. uh the covid 19 vaccine outreach i'd received an email from um, an organization 19 to zero 
and I'm wondering if we want them to share information. I think what would be important for me is that it's sharing information from 19 to zero, not from the city of Wetaskiwin. So I just wanted to know if council supported that or not. I'd sent the email to you guys to see if um, that was something that you wanted to have done. They would do town hall style webinars, sharing handouts with clear and easy to understand vaccine information or other formats that we find suitable for our community. Uh, is that something that we want to have happen or are we going to let the provincial government um, and their campaign for vaccines be what we resort to? And then out. The, the email that you sent out sounded like they wanted us to facilitate this. So when you say that it's not coming from council, but aren't they expecting that we are going to organize anything at all on this? It didn't, that's not the way that I interpret it. Interpreted it. The outreach that they're going to do, not that we're going to do, would be town halls, uh, webinars, sharing handouts, and sharing vaccine information. So I took it as they were going to do that. I just didn't want it to be, I wouldn't want it to see it as the city of Wetaskiwin is now taking this this on. If zero to or 19 to zero was an organization looking to um, get information out about vaccines that it would be coming from 19 to zero, not the city of Potosquin. Oh, it will for sure. And that's why I said that if these guys wanted to be the ones delivering that message, that's fine, not coming from the city of the council. Well, that's fine. If they want to I kind of agree with uh, what Al here because some of us have different views on on some of this stuff here, and if we do the cities, and we're actually going to get different ideas from each councillor, even though we support it. But I think uh, let let the big boys do what they have to do because I don't want to be starting answering questions or doing or having our staff take the time to do it. This organization wants to come and do it, let them do it. This is an AHS um, situation. Having said that, with the uh, low vaccination rates that are in our community, um, if there's some way that we can help um, within our community, I don't mind, but I don't want to spearhead anything. I don't think that that's, that's I think the staff's got other things that they need to be working on than trying to deal with uh, AHS situation so I don't think this is something that the city needs to be dealing with mm -hmm. um, the AUMA is hosting um, the summer municipal leaders caucus here in Wetaskiwin on July 29th and what we get a chance to um, present on something local and I thought we could have something as an indigenous theme I was thinking about having a drum group and a chief or two coming to speak on what land acknowledgement means to them, uh, truth and reconciliation, building relationships with many of the municipalities that would be attending. They'll be attending both virtually and in person. 
many of the municipalities don't border on a First Nation reserve, so don't have the ability to build those relationships like we do. <clears throat> so having the ability to have a chief or an elder come and speak to the group, um, I think would be beneficial through my work with mid-sized city mayors and AUMA. That's been one of the things that has been a hurdle for many municipalities is while they want to build relationships, they want to have a better understanding, especially of the culture and um, community residents in their municipalities, they don't know how to initiate that. So this will be something that will be worked on through AUMA and Midside Cities over the next couple of years, I would imagine. Um, if we have the ability to host uh, the Leaders Caucus and have that component to it, I think it would be really good. The only thing is, is that if we do get a drum group in, there would likely be an honorarium. And I'm just wondering if there is um, budget for something like that, or if that's something that needs to be made a motion of in the council meeting. Through the chair to Mayor Gandam, I do have a um, public relations budget that we could pull it from. Okay. And have you talked to Dan Rood yet, or is that? I sent him an email, so I'll follow up with him now that I'm back. Yeah, and I talked to him last Thursday during my last board meeting, and he said that he would be reaching back out to you again. Perfect. So I encourage everybody to attend that. They work out really well. There's five municipal leaders caucus throughout the province starting mid-July. I'll be in Bow Island and High River. And then the following week, I'll be in Sexsmith and Wetaskiwin. And then there's another one in Redwater, I think. Um, all of them will have, other than the local presentation, all of them will have the same content. So I'll be presenting on behalf of AUMA, and then obviously um, presenting here in Wetaskiwin on behalf of the city, as well as um, a board member there. And out of all of the um, dates there shown, I think there was between four and six board members attending each of the plus staff attending each of those dates and then with us when we start having 10 board members coming plus staff so it should be a good turnout here and the Ty eight sorry go ahead. Tyler on that one do we need to pre-register with anybody yeah through Karen yeah okay thank You've you sent that email right Karen yeah. yeah and the hate bill speech sorry did anybody else have anything else on the, the topics for Municipal Leaders Caucus hasn't been set yet. It will be right away. Um, the hate bill speech that I got from MP Mad Doris, is that something that we want to attach our name to? So the endorsement is on behalf of 13,000 residents of Wetaskiwin, the Mayor and Council of Wetaskiwin endorse MP Peter Julian's private member's motion M84 anti hate crimes and incidents and his private members bill C313 banning symbols of hate act. Are we okay signing our name to that? Okay. Karen, I'm going to send this to you and if you can just attach our information, that would be perfect. Just to the original, please. Anything other? You have no new addition, so we'll move into uh, 3A. CEO is up there. Um, so I was watching the emails when I was away last week, and there was a discussion around um, uh, reporting and crimes, uh, crime events that are happening within the community. And so I wanted to. I, I did have a, a ch chat with Keith a couple weeks ago, and he had sent me. Um, we were, we were just working on some updated numbers in between his reporting times. Um, obviously today he brought forward the stats for uh, the current um, reporting period. But if there's ever any questions in between, um, Keith has indicated he's more than willing to send those to me. So if you have specific questions, just let me know and I can forward those to Keith. Um, but more so the discussion was when things are happening within the community, when does council know, when, what should they know, um, that sort of stuff. And so I can um, confirm that when a major event is happening in the city, 
uh, both the mayor and myself are on a um, on a message system that's set up for the region to notify people when something's happening big in the community. Uh, they will let us know if there is danger and then we would work with their communications team and we would let council know. Outside of that, it's really just as information and let them do their job and, and so that we can say, yeah, we know that road is blocked, you know, the police are there, let them handle it. So uh, based on the emails that I saw last week, I believe there was a desire to have a discussion around um, what should be reported when, what does council need to know when, and so um, Inspector Drabs is also here to help with some of that. And if nobody wants to talk about it, we don't have to. I guess my concern was that um, there were some happenings that were on the city facility, although the facility, the city facility was leased out to another uh, organization. And so that raised the question for me is that as the owner of the facility that something has happened in, should we be informed of that? In terms of, of you know, we've had this conversation before and, and I don't wanna, it wouldn't be my intention to try and saddle Keith with copious paperwork because I'm sure he doesn't have enough of that already. But um, so for me, it was just that it was on city, on a city, in a city facility or on city grounds. Um, and I guess for me is that if there was a, a situation that was pretty violent, and I didn't know when I use the word pretty violent, what what qualifiers I had attached to that. Um, but when there was an incident, I think in front of RBC with a machete, for example, I mean, whether that's accurate or not, is a whole nother story. Um, but that's what I was hearing. And I had, I had zero response to that. I had no idea and not, and maybe I don't need to have an idea. Maybe I should be like every citizen that says, I have no idea what's happened with that. But my biggest concern was that being on our, in our facility. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Nielsen, I, I mean, to me, I don't look at that facility any different than the pool. If a, if an assault happens at the pool, we don't get notified, um, unless there is a reason to protect the public, protect city staff. If city staff were involved, we would get notified through our internal process. Um, but if the expectation, you know, is that we're more aware of what's happening, then we can work with Keith to see what that would look like. But um, I think that's a lot of, a lot of extra work where. There's nothing we can do, right? So knowing, knowing that something is happening major is good, but all of the other crimes, I mean, there's a lot that happened in a month, right? Just to go to your comment there, Mr. Nielsen, uh, I meet with, uh, with Paul and Trent and all our other partners, CAOs within the area. And we discuss current events that happened the week prior. Um, and if there's something significant that's happening around uh, the hub, for example, or whatever, that's gonna make a big splash in the media or something like that, I'm usually in looped in that tripartite group there uh, being uh, the CAO, uh, Paul, and the mayor and I usually give them a little bit of a I can't get much information because it's an ongoing investigation but I usually turn the tap off of you know we're on, we're not on a manhunt here it's it's managed right if it's going to be something significant then we usually have something in the press shortly thereafter the next day or within the next couple of days which then informs everybody of which but I would just caution council not to listen too much of what goes off on the rant and rave and that sort of stuff because it is completely inaccurate. If there is something that is developed that you're hearing about, if you get it back to Sue or Paul or, or the mayor and he wants to shoot me a message to say, uh, this is what we're hearing, can you let me know what's happening? I can set the record straight that way. Uh, so if you have a question, just shoot it over to 
one of the three and they'll get it to me and I can find out what's happening. Just one of the two, myself or Sue. Okay, um, the next piece that I wanted to chat about real quick was um, capital projects update. So I realized that we, we had a late start to budget approval. We were a little bit late getting a few projects out. We're anticipating to bring a full capital um, update to the next council meeting. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give you the heads up that there are some that we're having some challenges with, whether they came in over budget um, or we need to do a little bit more design work and, and re um, rejig the project schedules and stuff like that. So we'll be bringing that forward. But if you had any specific questions, we'd be happy to answer them today if we could. Otherwise, they'll be at the next council meeting. Sue, I have a question now. That 62nd Street over by the airport, I noticed the vacuum trucks have been working there. So one, was that on budget? And two, is completion this year or next year? So the 62nd Street project, um, the tender was awarded and construction will be starting in the next couple of weeks. Um, it, is, it did come in um, on budget uh, through the tender and it should be completed by the end of construction season in 2021. Who is the contractor? Just one second. on new edge trucks there along with vacuum. I can answer that. Yeah, it's new edge through the mayor. The chicken coops, did that come out too for tender? Which avenue is that? <laughs> Didn't hear that. Which avenue is that? 55? Behind Gabe's Park. Where you planted the trees. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. We'll have to. Um, do you know if the utility tender street. went out? Yeah. Well, Sorry, 51st Street? Yeah, I think it is 55F. Um, we'll have to look. We'll have a, a, a more substantial update at the next council meeting, but mm -hmm. um, a lot of the tenders either have closed already or are set to close right away. Any further questions? If not, we'll move into closed session. I need a motion to go into camera. Out. 